And that's what a lot of Trumpism is. It's this nihilistic desire to do harm to others, even if it harms the country and harms themselves. And it's very, it's a very disturbing psychology. And it's something, you know, we're still going to have, um, even after Donald Trump loses this election and is sent off to federal prison. And I, I, you know, I, we're going to have to deal with people who have this mentality and who have been behaving this way and, over, you know, overlooking the misanthropy and, um, I, you know, I, I, we, we're going to have to deal with these people. And I don't, and how we figure out how to do that is going to be an interesting question. Welcome, George. I hope everyone's going to uh, watch this and subscribe to the show and like us so that we get more viewers. Welcome Great. to the show. Anything I can do to help. Okay. Well, let's start with reports that you almost joined the Trump administration, either as the Solicitor oh, that's, General. That's, that's old news, not fake news, but old news. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true that you yes, almost did, but you not didn't. Not a Solicitor General, no. And, and you didn't, was there a particular reason or was it because? As well, I mean, I, I, the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, asked me if I would be interested in becoming head of the civil division of the U.S. Department of Justice, which would have absolutely been a great job. And I told him I would do it. Um, it's the world's biggest law firm, as you know, because uh, there's no bigger, more litigious or sued entity than the United States of America. And well, wait a second. How many lawyers do they have in the civil division? Uh, uh, a, you think a couple thousand? They have a lot. Yeah. It is. It I, is had, I had more than that I mean, when I was general counsel. I mean, I mean, if you if you and then if you count the U.S. attorneys off, it, it's. Cons yeah. I mean, I've heard it say yeah. that the, I've heard people say it's the biggest, yeah. it's the largest law firm on okay. the planet. Um, Except for the not, general true, counsel of probably, the U.S. Army. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there. Yeah, no. I mean, I think the. I mean, the, the U.S. government has plenty of lawyers. It needs lots of lawyers. Yeah, that's for sure. But, uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, the reason why I didn't ultimately do it, I mean, I actually went through the process of of interviewing people along with the attorney general's chief of staff and the a nominee for associate attorney general, um, Rachel Brand. We, not, we interviewed and selected um, the people who were going to be working for me. Mm hmm. And basically, I was watching the first couple months of the administration, and the they, FBI had run their background check, and all that remained was for me to finalize my financial disclosure forms, which really wasn't that hard because I had filled them out for Kellyanne, and um, it was in the White House then, and I, I just needed to modify it in certain respects to provide additional information about my side mm -hmm. of the finances, which required me to get some information from my law mm -hmm. firm. And I started dragging my feet on that. And I was dragging my feet. Not only, you know, I mean, the first it was, you, you, it's a pain, this stuff's a pain in the ass. I hate forms. I hate filling out forms. But as, um, and I, I wanted to get the, I, I was working on the background check first. I just like lost the will to do it. And I just was procrastinating doing it because I was just watching what I began openly calling a shit show um, in the White House. And, and you took that energy and you moved it into founding uh, the Lincoln Project and now yeah. um, and obviously becoming a very strong anti-Trump voice. And yeah. now a new path. There are a lot so of let's... steps in, in, along the way, but yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, you, you, you are now a leading voice uh, telling us that Donald Trump, your newest is, that he's a psychopath. And so you have the psychopath to right. raise money to. Anti, it's called officially the Anti-Psychopath Political Action Committee. We are not pro-psychopath. <laughs> the other side is pro-psychopath. The, oh, okay. the folks at and... Madison Square Garden last night. Definitely pro psychopath. Did you watch the rally? Fortunately, I did not. I did see some of the clips and excerpts, yeah. and I have, you know, I mean, this 
exercise in depraved nihilistic misanthropy is just, I mean, that, that really, I, I, I thought we'd reached bottom already. Actually, I don't never think we reached bottom with Trump, but I, 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 the depths to which that sank um, were surprising even to me, particularly, you know, they can't control themselves this close to an election. It's just, it's just crazy. I'm surprised that you could be surprised at anything but yeah, I mean, no, but I mean, you know, I mean, having a comedian go on and, and say some yeah. of the things that that comedian said, um, yeah. the, I mean, it was beyond vulgar. Um, and for it, a it vulgar is, crew. I've gotten to the point, and this is the first time I'm admitting this publicly, that not only did I not watch it, I'm starting to watch less and less news because I feel like I'm in 1939 Germany. And, you know, there's been a comparison between the rally and a 1939 rally of American Nazis in Madison Square Garden. And I, I don't think it's a, um, a stretch to make that analogy. No, I just no, feel no, like no. people are saying it can't happen here. And you, thankfully, are saying it can happen here. And you're yeah. doing something no, about it. This. I mean, it almost happened. It could happen. It could almost happen again. I don't think it ultimately will. I think that. Kamala Harris is going to win cleanly. Tell me more about um, that because I need to be talked off the ledge. Yeah, no, I, look, I mean, look, I think, it is, I mean, the, the polls are close because one would expect the polls to be close. That We are a completely riven society. We are very politically divided and there are large numbers of people who will vote for Donald Trump no matter what he does, whether he <laughs> shoots somebody on Fifth Avenue or shoots a million people on Fifth Avenue. And um, and the, but the polls don't can't measure enthusiasm. They can't measure turnout in advance. They they what they can do if you call a hundred thousand people and you're a pollster, you will be fortunate to get ten respondents. Oh, okay. Um, or or a hundred. I mean, somewhere between ten and a hundred. I mean. It, it would be, it's not, no, you, you, you would be, you, you, you put 10,000, you'd be, you can edit this like, if you yeah. could, um, you could, um, you, you call 10,000 people, you're going to get 10 maybe. Yeah. And when you finally call enough to get a sufficient sample size, that sample isn't going to be representative of mm. the public at large because it's, representative of people who bother to answer their phones. And these people, that's not a cross section of the public. I never answer my phone with an unknown number anymore. We're all on our cell phones. We don't use landlines for the most part. And so you're not, certainly not going to get the general population, a good sample for the general population. You're not going to get a registered voter sample. That's adequate. You're certainly not going to get a, likely voter sample that's adequate because you can't that's actually even if you had a perfect rv sample you don't know who's actually going to show up and you can ask yeah. people are you going to show up and sure they're going to say yes many people will say yes but they don't necessarily show up just just as you might say i'm going to go to the gym today and i'm not going to have that extra cookie today <laughs> and so what pollsters have to do to take their you know inadequate sample from no fault of their own the samples are not adequate and the samples have to be, you have to create a model of what you think the ultimate voting populace of likely voters is going to be. And that requires judgment. That requires an assessment mm -hmm. of the political environment. That requires looking at history and that requires, you know, looking at, and so what they do is they weight the results that they get. They have particular parameters where they're making assumptions about the electorate's political affiliation, race, gender, cult, creed, all sorts of things. And but you they know what you're then, saying makes go go ahead. I'm sorry, I thought you were yeah, done. No, go ahead. And, and they weight the responses to get an approximation of what they predict will be the electorate. But even the best pollster can't predict the electorate. And you know, 
I think personally, if I were a pollster, I would be making assumptions that the female turnout is going to be heavy and that the, that they're the dis disgruntled former Republican type result will be, I mean, the, 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 that will be heavy. I mean, I'd be making a bunch of assumptions. Um, and that doesn't even include the fact that there may be voters who are hesitant to publicly say that they are supportive of Kamala Harris. I mean, I met a, I, I, a woman, I, a woman I know in New Jersey yesterday told me not, you know, that, that she, you know, that she was like afraid of saying anything negative about Trump because people would jump down her throat. Um, well, I've been and, knocking on doors and I can tell you that there's a lot of people who are hesitant to say who they will vote for. Although almost everyone I knocked on their door said that they did have a plan to vote or that they had already voted. Um, mm -hmm. I personally suspected that those who wouldn't tell me, because I said I was from the Democratic Party, uh, that I was a volunteer. And so I think those who wouldn't tell me were voting for Trump. And I Not, had that may be, but there, but, but I, but there, the other part of what I was going to say is there's an existential fear among those people who oppose Trump because they understand the danger he represents clownish as he may be. And there's also a great enthusiasm because Kamala Harris is inspiring. She's younger. She's, yes. she's, she's, I mean, she's, she's charismatic and she projects hope which is normally the thing you want in a presidential candidate. And yeah. so I, I think the turnout factor is going to favor the, the, the Democrats. But, you, you know, if you're a pollster, you don't want to make assumptions that are too far out of line with the past because yeah. you, want, you want to stay in the middle of the past. You don't want to look like you, you know, you don't want to throw that long bomb and take that chance. And so tell so me, they're, tell me what so they're, you're they know, doing. They're, yeah. I, I want to know what, you, Lincoln Project and the Psycho Pack are, or the anti-Psycho Pack, um, are doing to get a message out and whether at this point, eight days from the final voting, um, although there's still an issue about whether votes that are received by mail, uh, that are postmarked by election day, but not received, whether they will be counted. But anyway, we're, we're getting close to the voting's over. Is there any message, anything, that will get through to the few people who proclaim to be undecided? To the few people, I mean, let's face it, about half the people who will vote will have voted before election day. I mean, the numbers are astounding in terms of early voting. So the message, whatever it is, isn't gonna affect their vote. So we're talking about a small percentage who are still left to vote and a few percentage, because as you said, this is a riven society. Is there any message that we'll get through? What message are you sending out? Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I think the message that's, that needs to be sent out and is being sent out by the campaign, that's, and they're doing very well at it, is that this man is unhinged. He's unstable, he's deteriorating, he's angry, he, he wants to use the government as an instrument of his, of his revenge. And he doesn't have your best interests in heart. And all of those things relate, to my mind, to yeah. his psychopathology. But you don't have to cast it in those terms. I mean, my, okay. my PAC has been doing that. Um, but, you know, the campaign just says unstable and says weird and unhinged. And that's sufficient because nobody wants to have or nobody should want to have an unhinged, deterior mentally deteriorating man um, in yeah. charge of the second world's second largest cache of nuclear weapons. So, uh, but I, I think that message is getting through because I think the reason why it hasn't gotten through in the past is because, um, you know, we've kind of accepted his abnormality as normal. I mean, that's what psychologists call malignant normality. And then that was compounded by the fact that after January 6th, and when he left, and then after he left the White House and went down to Mar-a-Lago, he was deplatformed. People didn't see much of him. Uh, most people didn't see much of him for at least two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
now that they're actually seeing him and now that they're actually paying attention and now that he's worse than ever, I mean, he was on the Joe Rogan show for two or yes. three hours and babbling about Lord knows what and saying he wanted to become a whale psychiatrist. I mean, you know, the talking about Hannibal Lecter and, and, and Kamala Harris having artificially intelligence created crowds and, um, it's talking more about windmills again, all this crazy, crazy stuff makes people, you know, I mean, even Joe Rogan was scratching his head at some of the stuff that Trump was saying. But doesn't and it I scare people, you that so many people actually believe what he's saying and don't think that I, I don't he's know that they, crazy? I don't know that they, I don't know that they all believe it. I think that we're, no matter what happens, even if she wins in an electoral landslide and gets 330 or 340 electoral votes, which I actually think is, is possible as an outside possibility. Mm. Um, we're going to be horrified at the fact that 75 million people, give or yes. take, will have voted for him. All right. And I think that many of those people know that he's full of shit, but they do it because they have, you know, deep seated resentments of people who are different from them and people who they think look down on them. And they also don't want to admit that they're wrong. And so they're committed to Trump in a very peculiar sort of way. There was a, an interview, I think, done during the primaries this year, or late last year, of a New Hampshire voter, I think it was in Politico, who was you know, a relatively well-educated guy, a former military officer who runs a small business in New Hampshire. And they interviewed a, re a reporter interviewed him and, and basically his reason why he supports Trump was that it's because he just hates all the people who don't support Trump or hates all the people who mm -hmm. oppose Trump. I mean, it's, and, and he, it was pointed out to him. It was like, okay, but the things you want to do are going to hurt you too. Yeah. And he said, he didn't care. And that's what a lot, of Trumpism is. It's this nihilistic desire to do harm to others, even if it harms the country and harms themselves. And it's very, it's a very disturbing psychology. And it's something, you know, we're still going to have, um, even after Donald Trump loses this election and is sent off to federal prison. And I, I you know, I, we're going to have to deal with people who have this mentality and who have been behaving this way and over, you know, overlooking the misanthropy and, um, I, you know, I, I, we, we're going to have to deal with these people. And, and I don't, and that's what scares how me, we George, figure out how to exactly do that. exactly what you're saying. Question. Yeah. yeah. But that is the big question. How do it we is a big question. come back together? I mean, I still remember when there was bipartisanship and when Democrats and Republicans had civil conversations to discuss issues like this, when we didn't, hate each other, when we didn't have different sets of facts. I mean, ever since I can remember, it has been you're entitled to your own opinion, not your own facts. You the can famous debate. line of Senator, yeah, it, of, of Senator yeah. Patrick Moynihan. Yeah. Exactly. And, and that was true then and should be true now, but it isn't. Um, I've engaged with Trumpers, and they simply reject Things like one said, well, I believe the election was stolen. There were ballot boxes that were flipping votes. There were suitcases that were being uh, under the table and then stuffed into ballot boxes. And then you confront with the facts about all the lawsuits thrown out. And they go, well, I don't believe any of that. So if you're in different universes, it's hard. It's hard to get past it. Yeah. And I do worry that whatever happens... And I do agree with you. I believe in the depths of my soul that we will soon have President Harris. And I very much look forward to that. Um, and, and by the way, what you said, you know, I, today I'm wearing a Just the Facts pin. It's a picture of Sergeant Joe Friday from Dragnet. But I debated wearing my uh, Trump unraveling, which is a ball of yarn, orange, unraveling with a yellow fluff of hair on top of it, or oh, my like hinge that. pin because he's unhinged. So um, I'll have to wear those for the next two shows. Uh, you have to send me send me a picture of those. And text oh, I me a will. Picture. I will. That'd be great. Um, so yeah, it, it was. I had it anyway. The fascist word is being used now, and 
I'm wondering if you think that's effective. What I worry about is that most people don't really know what fascism is. And besides, Trump calls her a fascist, a communist, and a socialist. And uh, so does calling him a fascist matter? He calls her low IQ. And people understand what that means. I'm not sure that fascist is effective. Tell me what you think. Well, I, I, I you know, I don't think it's ineffective. I think it's factual. Um, I don't think it's a matter of opinion anymore. I, I think yeah. he meets all the criteria beyond any reasonable doubt. At a minimum, you, you have to say he's fascistic. Yes. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it's I think it's important to say that I understand that not everyone understands the meaning of words and that meanings of words can be twisted and that one yeah. of the common tools in the in the Trump uh, toolbox is to project and say that the other side is all of the things that you yes. are yourself. Um, but I don't think we should be shying away to say that he's authoritarian or fascist. I mean, I think yeah. most people have a general idea that fascism is bad. I think there yeah. are a number of people who think deep down they won't say it this way, but they want fascism. They want authoritarianism. Oh. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but for the, for the, for normal people, it's scary. And so I have no problem use of the word fascistic, particularly, um, when it comes from, you know, it's not like the way that the Trumpers use fascism and communism as derogatory terms. I mean, they just throw those labels around to describe their political enemies. Mm -hmm. The people who are describing Trump as authoritarian and fascist are people who work for him and people who, you know, these generals, they, they, the, the reason why they understand this is because if you, you know, Military officers generally have a very good understanding of history. That's part of how they're trained. It's yeah. part of their interests. It's in their, it's in their bailiwick, um, whether they did it in college or at the, at a military academy or in a war college. They, this is something they have to think about because that's right. part, you know, it relates. You can't do your job if you don't understand geopolitics and history if you're a, if you're a military officer, yeah. not just military it's, history. It's not just the people and who so, work for him. It's so, people so, so who study what, fascism, like right. Ruth Ben-Ghiat and Tim Snyder, yes. um, historian Heather Cox right. Richardson. Right. And th there was but, uh, recently... But again, I mean, you know, the, the, it, his, own, what, what, his own people yes. saying it, which means it's not being used as... as, as a weapon. It's being used in an accurate and descriptive fashion. Yeah. There are also, I don't know if you've seen it, but um, Heather Cox Richardson, I think, was the one who I saw it published, was the Department of Defense um, during World War II had a, um, a message for soldiers to define fascism, to make them understand what they were fighting for. And it's brilliant. And you can't see that and not say, Trump, oh yeah, that, Trump, yeah, Trump, that. Um, and you've had some very good ads that are pointing out his uh, lack of mental acuity, his fascist tendencies. And, and I have a very weird question for you because it probably means okay. nothing. But you started the anti-psycho pack with $343,434.34. So I see 34, 34, 34, 34. Does 34 mean something to you? Well, it means something to Donald Trump. I mean, he was convicted on 34 uh, felonies in the it. Supreme Court of the state of New York for New York County. And, you know, he's a 34 times felon. There. Yes, so that's yes. the reason why I picked that number. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm so it, glad it I asked. It was about the right I amount, I felt. It was about the right amount, I felt. And, yeah. um you know, just that was the way I decided to do I it. I hope you're raising lots more money to continue we your and work. We've, we've also basically, we've now, we're kind of done because we've, we're in the process of having spent it all. We made sure that we're not going to have anything left in the tank. Right. Not just um, that you spent it all, Tuesday but morning. so many people have voted. Why keep spending your money? Although no, I love and, and, your billboard. Well, I mean, look, the, the, I, I believe fundamentally the cake is baked. Um, I, and, and, um, 
at least from my standpoint, because there's nothing, I, I, I don't think there, I can't think of anything else I can do at this point. So yeah. um, um, I'm kind of satisfied at, at this point um, with everything, except I don't know the result. Well, you are making me feel better um, uh, about Good. things, but let me ask you one other question that has, I, I'm really troubled by, which is the press coverage of this race. And I can't remember who said, he can be lawless, but she has to be flawless. Um, right. And it seems to me that the press reflects misogyny. Uh, I don't know if they're motivated by profit, that they get more clicks if they're horrible to her. Um, but how can they excuse or report, you know, this new phrase of they're sane washing what he says when he makes no sense? He says a comment about childcare to the economic club. And it's a total gibberish answer, and they reported as if he had actually answered the question. Yeah. Is, is canceling your subscription to all the papers that are doing that, you know, where are we going to get our news? I mean, we can't get no, it from I, I, I'm, I'm embedded not, I'm, sources. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't advocate that, although I did cancel my subscription to the Washington Post to send a very specific message. Um, because of the know, non-endorsement. Because of, because of the yeah. non endorsement which was just shocking i mean if you're going to pick you're going to pick a time to i i get it i mean i if newspapers all said tomorrow that they were never going to do another political yeah. endorsement um and that they were going to separate opinion columns and opinion journals more clearly from their news columns yeah. i would think that's a good thing actually because i think one of the problems we have in our society is that news and opinion and entertainment have become all glommed together and that's why we have fox news and, and whatnot that being said, I think there are a number of understandable reasons for the double standard, even though I absolutely despise the double standard and I am repeatedly complaining about the double standard. I think one relates to a point, and not necessarily the most important one, but it relates to the point, uh, one of the reasons why I started Psychopath, uh, anti-psychopath. Anti and it's that we don't talk about him in pathological terms. We don't, we don't, aren't in the habit, we don't like to discuss mental illness mm. and mental disorders, psychiatric disorders. And so people are hesitant and they don't feel they have the expertise. They are hesitant to basically say that he's whacked out. And reporters particularly are hesitant because it's highly controversial um, because there are so many people who object to it and don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the problems is that you, 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 if you don't say the guy's just nuts, you end up trying to explain him in the paradigm of a normal human mm -hmm. mind, which you cannot do. Once you understand his psychopathology, once you understand the elements of narcissistic personality disorder and paranoid personality disorder and mm -hmm. antisocial personality disorder, um, you realize it all makes sense. Everything he does makes sense um, from the standpoint of his psychology. Um, it doesn't mean that he's pre entirely predictable, but he is predictable in lots of ways. Um, it means it, it people who work with him and uh, um, actually understand it better than anybody. They understand that he is easily manipulable, um, although he can't be controlled. Um, but his personality characteristics are, are perfectly predictable. If you, you know, it, it, it's like what the Democrats did at the convention, needling him about the crowd size. It drives him nuts because it really goes to his deep seated narcissistic insecurities. Um, that's one aspect of it is that we normalize him by not treating him as pathological and treating him as abnormal. Um, and it's also a, a natural human tendency to, once you get used to something, we, we humans can almost get used to every, anything. Mm. And so you get used to this guy just spouting out this shit and it's not interesting or newsworthy or different a lot. And so what's, you know, what is news? News is, wow, something happened I just didn't expect. And then, uh, so, and, and, you know, Trump saying crazy shit is something we've come to expect. So yeah, he says that he says stuff, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then you have another aspect of 
why journalists say wash Trump. And it's the fact is, again, you can only say so much about the crazy stuff he does. I mean, they don't say enough, but at the same time, it's not, again, it's not news. And you can, if you try to explain it all and talk about it all, because he says crazy stuff every day, that's all you talk about. And often it is, you know, all people talk about. So the problem then is they feel like they have to give equal time. They have to discuss each candidate and each candidate's flaws or perceived inadequacies um, on an equivalent basis. Like uh, we ought to spend half our time on Harris and we have to spend half our time on Trump or else we are not doing our jobs. When in fact, and then that creates this false equivalence like, okay, you know, Kamala Harris wasn't specific about her plan for, um, you know, growing more kumquats, okay, in, in California. And she didn't specify, like, what kind of kumquats is, was, is, 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 is the agriculture department going to promote? And then you've got Trump talking about he wants to cut all federal, ta eliminate all federal taxes. And so you get that at lack of equivalence there. You get this, un, you know, she gets treated unfairly. It's ridiculous. And, you know, and, and there's more to that, too. There is like, you know, we saw that with the double standard on the age factor. I mean, here Trump yeah. was saying absolutely. He's been saying crazy, incoherent things and misstating things and misstating words and slurring words for years. Remember the time? I think it was 2018 or 2019. He held a rally on July 4th. You know, it was really to assuage his own ego at the Lincoln Memorial. And he talked about um, Revolutionary War airports being captured. <laughs> yes. And he talked yes. about um, yes. ramming the man parts, which seemed kind of, mm, that's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and if Joe Biden had done that, uh, you, would not, you know, they, they, again, they just treat that as normal and normal, you know. When you when you listen to Joe, when Joe Biden was actually pretty coherent at that debate, if you look at a transcript, the, the debate that ended basically ended his political yeah. career, um, he he was he was he was coherent, and and um, Trump is never coherent. Even when he's talking forcefully, he's not coherent. He doesn't yeah. finish sentences. He doesn't. There's no thread to what he says. It's just all a word salad. But it sounds vigorous. And, you know, uh, it, again, the, the press, um, you know, misplayed that. They finally now are kind of mm. correcting it. But what it took was this absolutely horrid and massive deterioration that is ongoing as we speak with Donald Trump's psyche. Yeah. And his. And, and I think you're describing something that sounds like, you know, the lobster in the warm water. You know, if you put it in boiling frog, water, yeah, it's going to try to get out. Or the frog. frog. Yeah. No, that's frog, absolutely yeah. right. That's frog absolutely or lobster. Right. I mean, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's lobster, we yeah. are the frog in what is close to boiling water, and we yeah. better jump out we, right. we and don't, vote right. the we right don't way. We feel it because it's um, like, oh, it's been warm for a while. Yeah, it, um, it, but it's really at a boiling yeah. point. And I, I have to say, I remember part of what you said. I don't remember ramming the man parts. I think that might have to be the name of this episode of the show. Ramming the man part. Yeah, no, it, yeah. it um, had kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a, I won't say, but it had a had an odd feel to it. <laughs> well, there's less than a week left until voting ends. And um, what can I and viewers do? What What should we be doing? I'm out knocking on doors. I, that's what you can Sending do. Sending postcards. Knocking on doors, you know, just keep keep doing what you're doing. And and I, and I, I have to yeah. say, I mean, that that's another reason why I am reasonably confident that she's going to win. It, is that you, you cannot? I mean, I, I I mentioned today on Twitter. I was we saw a poll today mm -hmm. where. Kamala Harris is up by 12 points in the second yes. congressional district of Nebraska, which is that part around Omaha yes. and Council Bluffs that yeah. actually is right. not quite. It's purple. OK, it could go either way. Um, but it's the one vote that's clearly attainable for the Harris campaign. She's up by 12. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to say, I went to Kansas City a couple of weeks ago. I, I headlined a Harris Victory Fund fundraising mm. event. 
And all these people were, you know, these are, these are not, these are people with other things to do, right? Serious jobs, and, you know, lawyers and doctors and whatnot. And they were talking about the bus trips that they are making. And mm. again, we're going to make during the weekends to canvas in the Omaha area. I was like, you don't see, I don't, we didn't, I, I've never seen that level of mm. enthusiasm and energy anytime where people are going out there and taking buses to other states. I mean, I, I know it has happened in the past, but not to this extent. The volunteer operation that the Democrats have is yes. just extraordinary because people are so motivated. I went out and knocked on doors in, yeah. in, in Bucks County uh, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, now, I'd never done that before. Yeah. And um, I just felt like this, that I had to do it. I had to do, I had to do my yeah. part. And I, 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 you cannot duplicate that level of, you know, it's a combination of existential fear and enthusiasm. You can't duplicate that. And at the same time, the Republicans basically farmed out their get out the vote operations to a bunch of shysters and to Elon Musk. And basically, you, you know, those don't really work very well when you're just hiring people to hand out literature. You get people who not aren't necessarily committed to the job. And in the case of the Musk um, pack operations, they were, you know, it was reported last week that, that it was found that a lot of the people they had hired to canvas were faking their, their, their routes and clicking on their apps to say that they had knocked on doors that they had not at, knocked on and, and so on and so forth. So I, I do think that um, there are a lot of things going on here that are, that are very positive. Well, we're going to have to end with that positive note. I want to thank you, not just for being a guest on um, this show, uh, which I hope everyone listening is going to subscribe to. It's free. Just subscribe and like us so that other people will find the show. But I want to mostly thank you for all you're doing to protect democracy, to make sure that people get out and vote, and that they get three of their friends to get out to vote because in many of the swing states, three votes per precinct can make the difference in the outcome. Absolutely. So it's really important that whatever your issue is, you convince your friends to come out and vote for Kamala Harris on November 5th or sooner in any state that is allowing you I to vote do it today. Sooner. Good for you. I voted last week before I went to Wisconsin to campaign. So um, because you. Illinois is a blue state, I don't need to knock on doors here, um, right. but no, I you gotta, do need no, to do it in Wisconsin. Wisconsin is, the good, is a good investment. It is a very, and it's so well run. Ben Wickler is a genius. He's the head of the Democratic yes. no, these, Party these there. These Democratic state parties are, are, yeah. are knocking it out of the park. They really are. Yeah. They are well. It's really Meanwhile, amazing. Meanwhile, the Republican state parties are at war with themselves. So um, anyway. Yeah. Good. That's right. a good thing. That makes me happy. So thank you. I hope we'll talk again after we have elected Madam President. And that maybe I'll see you instead of at the convention, I'll see you at the inauguration. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that, Jill. 